Okay, let's pick up on page 346. We've got a lot of this book left to share with you. And then, of course, my rating. And what kind of rating do you think my favorite author is going to get? Outstanding, of course. Anyway, it kind of reminds you of Beth and Rip just a little bit, doesn't it? But there was no age difference. But, I mean, they're, they're kind of banter back and forth where she says things that's over his head a little bit. Anyway. He shifted. I thought that was getting married. Uh, that getting married would solidify some things for me. It was part of the practical life that I had laid out for myself. That was the one thing about my parents, Lila. What they had together was real. I figured that if I set up a life that I didn't have the burdens of poverty, that my marriage could only be stronger. It wasn't something I was ready for. It wasn't something I was even particularly suited for. I've learned that I'm better off alone. You didn't love her enough. Lila said softly. Those soft words were like a bullet cutting straight through to his heart. What? She didn't love you enough either. If she had, she would have stayed. I think about that a lot. Because the way my parents did it, that straight 50-50 split to me, that is a lot about the way they saw marriage in general. I've always thought you had to be willing to give all of yourself to let go of everything. And the very person who loves you would never ask you to do that. But you got to go all in, 100%. You can't give 50%. That's kind of the thing that leads you to being able to easily take your kids right back. Divide your assets, divide your kids. Page 347. Maybe you're right, but I could have never give up, give all that to someone else. I didn't have any control growing up. Everything was the way my dad said it had to be. He worked that land like a man possessed, and that didn't make it give and that didn't make it give us anything that we could hold on to. It was useless, worthless, failed us more often than it yielded anything valuable. My mother supported that dream with all of herself. She went hungry as a consequence, so did I. I couldn't do that to any woman in my life, to any children I might have. My father knew, never knew what a support system he had in her. He used her until she was broken, and I know he didn't mean to do that, but she stood by him and never complained, and I never wanted to build a life like that, one where I took it and another person gave, and I never even knew what it, it, it was happening. I guess it's complicated, Lila said, sounding sad. I always wanted to think that I can figure all this out, but I'm going to have to find some magic amulet or something someday, and maybe it'll all help make it click. You really do spend a little too much time in those fairy tales. Maybe that's part of the problem, but fairy tales are simple. They punish the bad and reward the good. Even when it all seems impossible, people with pure hearts and optimistic minds win in the end. She looked at him for a long moment, and he could feel a gulf expand between them. In spite of the fact that they were both still... Well, they had been busy. I think it was probably best that if this just happened one time. He didn't know exactly what had caused that dismal revelation that he couldn't figure out what whether he was relieved or disappointed to hear it. Reason being, he asked, because she was the one to fling, fling pushy questions around here whenever she felt like it, and he didn't see why he couldn't do the same. I think I learned what I needed to. He didn't like the idea of this being a lesson for her. I didn't learn anything. Well, maybe I'm not a lesson for you. Maybe I'm just another experience. You have to make everything mean something, Lila. I try because otherwise my father didn't want me and my mother is too distracted to care about anything but herself. The one person who really loved me is gone and all that I have left is her house. What happened between us years ago was just me being overdramatic and hurting myself. I like to think it's all connected, all the threads that go together to make it the tapestry of a person's life. Intentional and beautiful when you stand far away from it, even if you can't see it up close. I think that's optimistic, honey, he said. Well, I'm still an optimist, even if I acknowledge that the need to make up some list. All right, he said. I better get dressed and head on out. Once was for the best, and he couldn't give her anything. She was the kind of woman who needed promises to be made for her. Because if anything, she told him about her life, she was true. The poor girl needed someone to care, and he just wasn't the right guy. Lila said nothing. Instead, she tucked herself into bed and watched as he dressed. You're still going to help me, she said, right? Yeah, he said, June asked me to. 
Lila nodded right, of course. I'm not going to let you down, Lila. My word is my word. I don't break it. Except marriage vows. He supposed it wasn't death that had broken that him and Tanya apart, just his own hard-headedness, and while he didn't regret the end of that marriage, the reality of that, a broken promise, the size well seemed to be lingering between them and call him a liar. I believe you, she said. Everett finished dressing, and the last thing he did was put his hat on, and as ridiculous as it seemed, he also felt like it was the right thing to do to tip at once before walking out of her bedroom. See you soon, he said. Yeah, Lila said. See you soon. Okay, 356. Where are we starting at, 356? Lila had chosen to try and to be a sunbeam in the dark space, and she learned that sometimes the darkness could just swallow the light whole, no matter how hard you tried to shine. She, didn't, she knew J.J. didn't understand that. She tried to be an optimist because everything around her was so grim. J.J. just found her annoying. Think about doing the flowers. And in the meantime, he said, taking the pile of lumber over to the corner, you can help by crawling up there and ferreting out the scarecrows. Lila grimaced. That sounds like nothing I want to do. You don't like scarecrows? Creepy, vacant faces? I admit, I'm not overly fond of them, no. Are you a bird, Lila? he asked. He might be teasing her, but that made her stomach feel strange. She resented him for that. She frowned at him. No, I'm not a bird. Are you sure, he asked. It's typical birds that have an aversion to scarecrows. She tossed her hair back behind her shoulder, and she did her best to look regal. I have more of a rodent energy. He stared at her, his face totally flat. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. It's true, she countered. Vibrant, cheerful, easily spooked. You are not easily spooked. I am, she said, keeping her expression serious. He moved in her direction, his eyes blazing with heat, and as she froze, all the air drawing itself out of her body, he stopped when he was less than a foot from her, and she could feel the heat radiating off his body, could feel it echoing inside her in a scorching wave. And I think that's where we were supposed to stop. So we're going to pick up again on 359. Well, are there mice up there? You have a road and energy, he called up. Commune with them. I do not want to commune with actual rodents. I only like rodents that are ceramic, felt, or knit. I imagine there's a full spectrum of mice up there. She huffed and crept around a covered pile of something in the back. She breathed an intense sigh of relief when she removed the cover and found no creepy crawlies of any kind, but she did find a sack of large raffida scarecrows. These are huge, she said. They go out in front. They're not scary, she said, looking down at them smiling faces. June made them, he said. Lila stared at them and blinked. Okay, maybe she was never going to be a huge fan of scarecrows, but knowing Grandma June had made them had made a pause for a moment, letting her fingertips drift over the material. She always known that Grandma June liked to make things, pies, blankets, quilts. Seeing this kind of handiwork made her feel connected to her, the way that her garden did, the way that the house did. Okay, so this is 359, 360. We're going 61, 62, 63. Okay. Grandma June was a part of her, more than her own mother would ever be. She felt angry sometimes at the way her mother lived her life, the way that she had cut everyone out of it because it failed marriage and as if that one heartbreak had destroyed her on such a deep level that she refused to allow anyone to ever matter to her ever again. Her father was the same. But Lila's mother had Grandma June and Grandma June would have been there for her and Lila knew it. She was there for you and that's what matters. You okay? Everett's voice came much closer this time and she hadn't realized he'd come up behind her. I'm fine, she said. It's just, it's been months now, but sometimes that she's gone, it takes my breath away. I know that we're, we were at the funeral. I know that we said our goodbyes, but it doesn't feel like it. He reached over and put his hand over hers. It was big, warm, and calloused, reassuring in ways that she didn't want to ponder too deeply. She looked at his hand and then up at his face and just realized she didn't feel alone. Even dealing with the realization, harsh and stark, that Grandma June was gone, she felt warmth deep in her heart and comfort. A sense that she was there, in her heart at least, if not beside her, where she could see her. Thank you, she said, pulling her hand from beneath his, because taking that kind of comfort from Everett was too dangerous. 
I loved her too. She believed in me like you said she believed in you. It was amazing what belief from one person can do for you. Just the one. Lila nodded. It's true, and I think that my creativity I got from her. I think that if my mother had just learned to knit or something, she might have gotten over some of her bitterness. You think that knitting cures bitterness? His turn was incredulous. I think that learning to create changes something in your soul, she said. No matter what it is, when you can cre bring beauty into the world, it forces you to appreciate what's beautiful in the world. When I was little, Grandma June taught me to knit, and I learned something from that. That if I could add a little something to this planet, even if it wasn't strictly useful, I at least felt like I was more than just me. I can leave little things, like I leave little things I made wherever I go, and that makes me feel connected to this world. She moved her fingertips over the scarecrow, and now to Grandma June. Working the land is what makes me feel connected to it, he said. He moved away from her, going over to the wood that was stacked up against the wall and grabbing another bundle. You can't stay disconnected when the dirt has some of your blood in it. I don't imagine so. It's one of the things that make me understand my old man, he said. The connection to the land, I can almost sympathize with him for the way he clung to it until it killed him. He said that as firmly and practically as he did everything else. Something about that, those words of grief, so fat, flatly and simply spoken, made them feel even more painful. She could tell it wasn't something that he talked about before somehow, and the honor of being the one that he did talk to made her glow inside even though it hurt, she hurt for him. Did it, she asked. Her chest was hollowing out with a pang of horror. horror. Did it kill him? Cancer killed him, but it didn't have to. If he'd been able to take care of anything other than that piece of ground that he poured his whole life into, he might have gone to the doctor and spared himself. He ignored it until treatable became a death sentence. But you know it was land in the end, because he never could have done nothing, anything that might jeopardize that land. He had sacrificed our happiness, our health, our safety for that land. And so nothing could ever come before it. Sometimes I wonder if I'm not that different. Why? Just because this is important to you? It isn't the same. It's been productive and it's been profitable. And it was more important than my marriage. Are you... It hurt Lila to even say it. And even... Sh it shouldn't hurt. Are you still in love with her? With her? It did need to be asked, because after all, Everett hadn't been with a woman other than her in the last two years, and if he could give any reason he wanted, but she had to wonder if it actually had to do with feelings for his ex. He shook his head. Not at all, but you know, that stubbornness in my blood, that feeling that gives up its own kind of sin, so holding on when you're supposed to mean letting go, you can see that. And what happened with your dad, with his farm? I suppose that's true enough, he said. They didn't talk more than that. He gathered the wood and went back down the ladder and then took a hold of the scarecrow, making her way down after him. The scarecrows were slightly flat from being stored for a year, but since they had been under a tarp and Everett's barn was clean and well-maintained, they were not really worse for wear, as scarecrows went. Okay, now we're going to page 374. We're getting there. I wasn't expecting you. I know, Lila said. I figured I would ambush you so that you wouldn't find an excuse to be busy. What makes you say that? Well, we haven't seen each other. I mean, I haven't come here, but you... You haven't come to see me either. I know, J.J. said, keeping her voice measured, but I had the opportunity to be in the house when you weren't here. And I think, I think Grandma June has a lesson for all of us. And I don't think it would do you any favors if I jumped in on the middle of it. I am, however, happy enough to have you jump into my life, but I didn't feel it was my place to intrude on you, not right now. That made Lila's eyes feel scratchy, and it created a whole build-up of words she didn't know how to untangle. It was disconcerting for a woman who used to be having a whole, having to hold words back to find herself speechless, which seemed to be what often happened with her sister. But she thought of Grandma June's letter and of her time with Everett and all those affirming words he said to her yesterday in the barn, when they still been close together, skin to skin, and everything in her head still burned as if he was still with her. <clears throat> Cleaning it up just a little bit. I, I guess, yes, that's true. She sends f us four different letters, and she didn't have us going to the house altogether. There must have been a reason for that. I didn't stay away to hurt you, J.J. said. 
and only hit Lila with the part of her that was hurt that felt like while J.J. might not have done it on purpose, she might not have actually thought of her at all, might have actually hurt her accidentally. I know, she said, this is, my, this is the house, and those are the girls, Lola and Ellie. They waved. They had that look about them, particularly the younger or bedraggled fairies, and the idea of J.J. parenting such soft feminine things seemed, well, perfect. If Grandma June had intended to change J.J. to provide some missing piece for her, then she probably certainly had done it, more than because she had love. She had Cade. Lila ignored the burning in her chest that might have easily been labeled as jealousy. I don't want to take a lot of your time, she said. I mean, I want to catch up. I do. J.J. quirked a smile at her and seemed to say, Do you? Lila ignored it. I, I wanted to know if I could buy some flowers from you, she asked. Flowers? Everett mentioned it. Everett McCall, she tried to suppress the blush that she could feel mustering in her face. He's working at an organization called the Red Sled Holiday Bazaar with me. Okay, 374, 375, 376, 377, 378. Okay. J.J. nodded. I took over the garden here and on the property, and all seasonal flowers are blooming right now. I want them. I want all of them. I want to arrange them for the bazaar, put them all over the place. She hesitated. If you're here, you left Dad's business then. J.J.'s smile turned rueful. Uh, yes. And are you going to do it here as a business? It's all I know, so I was mostly planning on continuing with it, yes. Well, I'd love to advertise with you, and the people will know that they can get their flowers from you and that you'll do their landscape. That's nice of you. It was such a cautious thing to say, too cautious for two sisters. But Lila didn't know how to shift, how to fix it. Well, I'll, it'll be good, because I know how to arrange them, and you're good at growing them, and I, it'll be a fantastic way to showcase them. Let me take you out to the garden. It was a truck ride away to the fenced-in flower garden on the property. The Massewson Ranch was huge spread, which stood to reason it worked for Cade by his five brothers, and she could easily see how a place like this, with so many wild acres, need all hands on deck. The garden area seemed manicured when compared to the rest of the wild around them. The sharp green mountains blanketed with pine and the uneven fields with green grass and intermittent gart patches of weeds with spiky purple flowers. In the garden, white gardolia with deep purple centers, begonias and sherbet hues and cheerful yellow aconite were planted in the regimented rows behind a deeper, deep, deer-proof fence. It spoke so much of her sister, wild by nature, but tamed into something deeply practical and by necessity. They're beautiful, Lila said. They'll be perfect for the holiday bazaar, J.J. said. They will. And as they were about a thousand more words that she wanted to say, something that she wanted to fix, but she couldn't figure it out. She couldn't find a way. I'll take all of them. J.J. grinned, okay. For money, obviously, I have cash for the event. I wasn't going to give them to you for free, don't worry. Lila laughed, I wouldn't expect you to. Hey, did you, did you find anything on the table when you got to Grandma June's? Lila blinked, I know. Oh, okay. Why, did you leave me something? It's not a but Leela sensed it was. She wasn't sure if she could or should push her sister for more information. They worked in companionable silence, and even though Lila wished that she could make it more, it felt good for her to work with her sister. She was glad even that she and JJ could find a way to blend their lives. They could blend their talents this way. At least she tried to be happy about that. But when she drove away from her sister's house, she just felt a bit achy and raw. We're on 378 now. And she couldn't, for the life of her, figure out why. Sometimes it was so difficult for two people who wanted to find a way to close a rift to be able to find the materials to bridge that gap. But she didn't have the answers. No answers, but a car full of flowers. And tonight she was going to spend the night at Everett's, so there was that. Okay. So moving on. Page 386. Okay, remember she asked Lila if she found something? <clears throat> Sorry. It was the note that she did leave her sister. <sighs> More water. Lila, in some ways, I'm sorry my summer has ended, but I'm happy for your fall to begin. 
Grandma June knew what she was doing when she asked us to stay here. Kyra and Remy found each other again. I found Cade and Laura and Ellie. I found some healing. I've been hurting for a long time over the way Mom left me. Seeing my hurt reflected in those two little girls gave me a lot to think about. It gave me some peace. Whatever happened between Mom and Dad, it wasn't our fault, and I'm tired of letting their choices come between us. When Grandma June's letter makes sense to you, come and see me. Love, JJ. Okay, Lila's heart felt cracked and sore. She moved fingers over her sister's resolute penmanship and fought back tears. No wonder JJ had seemed expectant when she'd gone to see her about the flowers. She left a letter, but Lila hadn't found it until just now. It wasn't our fault. I'm tired of letting their choices come between us. She did feel that. She held on to it, an unfair resentment for her own sister because she imagined their father loved her best. But J.J. hadn't felt any better about their mom taking Lila. And all that resentment was unearned, directed at a sister who would have been there for her if Lila hadn't let her parents' games make her bitter. She had been so convinced of her own optimism and cheer of her brightness that she missed the glaring darkness down inside of herself. How had she missed it? Because you didn't want to see it. You wanted to blame other people. The revelation made her face hot, made her ears pulse, and made it... It was her fault, too. It always had been. Okay, so that's page 386, 387. Moving on to 392. Love wasn't just rainbow and fairy tale endings. Love was acceptance. Love was patient. Love gave and love shouldered the burden of other person. Love wasn't 50-50. Love was everything. In her mind, that had always meant a haze of happiness, but that wasn't it. Not when it came to her family and not when it came to Everett. Love wasn't an optimist or a pessimist. It wasn't a realist. Love didn't sit back and receive. Love was action. Love bore burdens. Love hoped. And most of all, love believed. Though all the hard things through the dark moments, love pushed through the, when things got tough. And it was only that love, love that was a poet and a warrior, that did all those things. That could conquer anything. Rifts created in childhood that had widened over time. Scars cut deep by distant fathers and mothers who didn't care. That was love that endured. That was love that never failed. Okay. Page 396. So this is 396, 397, 398, 399, 400. I still love you, she said, just in case you were wondering. I changed my mind in the last two minutes. Lila, I appreciate it. Don't you dare, she said standing, and she stamped her foot. Don't you dare patronize me. I don't want to appreciate my love. I want you to accept it. Everett, I have loved you forever, and I believe in fate, just a little bit. I think that it brought me here this autumn, and it threw me and you together. Fate, Grandma June, I believe in it. I believe in her, and I believe in us, in this. And I just think that some things in life we can't see, we can't touch, we can only feel them. I just don't believe in that, he said. His voice was hoarse. Well, you're not going to like the rest of my revelation, she said. I also believe that we can have all the magic, but if we don't put work behind it, then it doesn't matter. We have to show up. We have to give, but we also have to do that. We can make it. And Everett, I know you're a man that makes miracles. If you weren't, you wouldn't have the ranch that you have. I'll bring the magic, but let's both work. bring the work. I can understand that you need to be up at 4.30 in the morning for work. I can do better at supporting you. I can be whatever it is you need me to be. Everything in him rejected what she had to say because he couldn't believe it. No one had ever given a damn about what he needed, and he didn't know why the hell they should start now. Most of all, it seemed to him like this offer required him to need her back. And the very idea filled him with dread. He couldn't quite capture that dread, couldn't define it, he couldn't explain it, and he didn't really want to. 
No, he said. I don't want to have this fight with you, Lila, and I don't want to have to humiliate yourself. Shut up, Lila said, moving forward towards him like a fiery ball of rage and indi indignation and beauty. I want everything and I always have from you. I am so tired. Why should I have always take half, Everett? Why? Half of my parents, half of my sister. Why? Why is that my life? Is there something fundamentally wrong with me? There's nothing the hell the matter with you, Lila. There's something wrong with me. Stop loving people who are broken and see how far you get. He couldn't even figure out where those words had come from. But the moment he had said that, he known it was true. He was the one with the problem. It wasn't her. It was him. Okay. His own father had been the barren, useless piece of land more than he loved him. There was a flaw in him, and it was nothing that he could ever overcome. His wife had married him thinking that she could change him, and when it turned out that he was exactly who he had shown he was, she wanted out, and he hadn't wanted to change. We're all broken people, she said. If we can't love each other in spite of the brokenness, the world would be a sad, dark place. It is a sad, dark place, Leela. At least for me it is. Find a guy like you, Everett said. Find a guy who sees the bright side of everything. Find a guy who's your age, who isn't married to a ranch already, who isn't, who isn't so damn walled off that he can't figure out how to feel anything. You feel things, she said, and her voice was small. I know you do. You were torn up about your horse this morning. It's a responsibility, he said. If you can't take care of horses, you shouldn't have them. It's my job to take care of them. I slacked. I got distracted. And honest to God, Lila, if it weren't for that, I might let you go ahead and love me and live with me. Except it wouldn't last. It wouldn't last. You would get tired of it and you would want to live, want to leave. And I wouldn't be able to blame you. So just go now. Finish out your time here, but it's not going to be with me. You're a coward, she said. And you need to st stop acting like a wounded child. I was a wounded child. So was I, but I grew up, and I want, I want healing. A wounded child turns into a wounded man, a wounded woman, unless we heal ourselves. She looked down, twisting her hands together. My sister wrote to me about healing, about how she found hers. We have to take control of it, of this life, of what we've been given. That's what Grandma June did, leaving us this place. I know that her daughters broke her heart over and over again, but she's trying to fix it with us. She's giving us something, something to work with, but we have to be willing to take it. My mother had all this, but she kept waiting for her life to fix itself. But we can't do that. We have to make our own magic, Everett. There is no magic. Well, then, that's it, she said, shrinking back all the small and sad. There won't be any if you won't let us make it. I believe in the happy endings, but I believe you have to work damn hard for them. And if you don't want to work, all I do is work, he said. That's the problem. No, the problem is that you're afraid. You haven't seen enough good in, to believe in it. I would believe in it enough for the both of us. That's your optimism, he said. He dressed the rest of the way and gritted his teeth against the pain as he turned away from her. And he walked out the front door and it seemed to slam itself behind him, like the farmhouse was giving him a shove right on out. Don't be like that, he growled. You taught me about hard work and now I'm doing it. It's why I have a home. It's why I have a life. It's why I'm not starving. It's why I can go to the doctor when I need to, so don't get mad at me now. But he was yelling at a slam door, and for a man who claimed superior practicality, he had to admit that was a little bit ridiculous. And as he walked out to his truck, the night fell oppressively black, and not even his headlights on the two-lane highway could do anything to make that feeling go away, and he pulled into his ranch through the giant wrought iron gates up to the massive house, and for the first time in his adult life, he wondered why the hell it mattered. Right now, he just didn't know. Okay. Page 402, 403, 404, 405, 406, 407, 408, 409, 410, 411, 412, 414. How is everything going? Lila couldn't muster up an emoji. Okay. She went about the rest of her day completing her checklist and doing last minute confirmations with vendors and was completely surprised when there was a knock on the door. She was even more surprised when she opened to find the J.J. and Kira standing there, Kira and J.J. together. She hadn't seen Kira since the funeral, and she suddenly felt silly over that, guilty. 
She had an excuse about why she hadn't reached out, how she didn't want to bother her and Remy, but it had never been about that. It had been about her own heart, her own hurt, her own anger. What are you doing here? You said you were okay. There was no exclamation point or anything. There was no smiley face. There wasn't even an emoji of some mammal. That means you're seriously depressed, J.J. said. Kira nodded. We came to see what was wrong. Who said anything was wrong, Leela asked. You know, okay just means okay. Not when you say it, Kira said. Funny how her cousin could be so insightful no matter how little they spoke anymore. She looked at Kira and J.J. now. They were women different than when they first were girls. Kira looked every inch of elegant cowgirl, her blonde hair tamed into a braid and her denim jacket over a fitted white top. J.J. was even herself, simply and serviceably dressed, except the sweater seemed to have llamas knitted into it. Are you wearing llamas? Lila asked. The girls chose it for me, J.J. said, frowning. Another reminder of how things were just a bit different now in strange ways, but wonderful ways. I'm just a bit busy. I'm putting together flower arrangements and everything for the Red Sled Holiday Bazaar, Lila said. And, J.J. prompted, and nothing, Lila said, turning away from the door and stomping into the house. You seem edgy, J.J. said, which is weird because you are many things, but edgy is not one of them. I found your letter. Lila looked down just now last night, and I was going to text you, but some things happened, and I... I'm sorry. I don't know how to talk to you. You're so practical, and I'm not. I'm just a pest to everyone, and I know it. You're not a pest, J.J. said, and I admit that your cheerful demeanor horrified me a little bit when we were younger, as did your insistence on embarrassing yourself sometimes with your open declaration of feelings. But that's my stuff. It's not yours. You don't have to take that on board. Yeah, my sister finds me horrifying. I don't have to take that on board. Well, you find me mean, and you find me not fun, so I have to deal with that. Maybe we're just too different. But the lovely words from the letter stood between them now, not their differences, and Lila, even in her diminished state, felt hope. Who said different was bad? J.J. asked. It's not like you're wrong to look at life that way that you do. In fact... I'm a little jealous. I've always had to be the practical one, and I always had to keep things together, and you just didn't. I always was jealous of you, Lila said. People could depend on you, and they didn't think they could depend on me, she blinked, because Dad loved you best. Well, Mom took you, J.J. said. Our mother let our father just have me. How do you think that made me feel? Both of your parents suck, Kira said, and I say that someone whose parents also suck. They didn't have another kid to pay, play off me, so they could just only screw up me between the two of them. But for the record, neither of you are bad people. Your mother and father are, though, and all that stuff between the two of you just comes back to them. I, Lila, looked at Kara, and their hearts twisted. I know, she said. I mean, I think I really do, but I just... You're going to have to do some difficult things, things that you won't like. Those words were coming back from her, from her grandma. She found herself crying again, which is what she hated more than anything. Grandma June had been right, and it hadn't even been about Everett. It hadn't even been about the Red Sled Holiday Bazaar. I'm sorry, Lila. I'm sorry about that I spent a long time pretending that I didn't have any bad feelings that might have made it impossible for you to get to know me. I just couldn't. I thought of that, and I started crying. I would never stop. I thought that if I was practical, I would have to acknowledge that we might never have a relationship again, that Mom and Dad were never going to reconcile, that Dad might never actually want me. That the man I love ne might ne never actually want me back, and so I didn't want to be like that. I didn't want to be anything but resolutely positive, and that made me so no one could really get close to me. It made me so I couldn't even get close to myself because I just shoved aside everything hard, and I couldn't even figure out what I wanted anymore. She closed her eyes. I know now. I want a relationship with you, J.J. I want one with you, Kira, and I don't want to be alone anymore. I don't want to be resentful, hiding it all behind blaming you. I don't want that anymore either, J.J. said. We're never going to be the same, but I think the problem was we thinking we might have to be. I would rather be more like you right now. Everything worked out with you and Cade. Everett, I knew you still had a crush on him, Kira said. It's not a crush, Kira, Lila said. Her immediate reaction was overly sincere. I'm devastated. And it was so comically sim similar to her epic performance, she wailed all through her grandmother's farmhouse seven years ago that it was almost funny except for the broken heart.
Okay, here comes 406. Sorry, Kara said, suppressing a smile. I mean, really, but what happened? He said he doesn't want me to love him. Did he say he didn't love you? Kira asked. Lila frowned. Well, no, but he said that we couldn't be together. He thinks we're too different. She made a broad gesture. Because he's very practical and I'm very not. Is that what he said? I don't know. I think he's afraid. I think he's been hurt, but so have I. I know you've been hurt, J.J. said. But one of the things I've always admired about you, Leela, is that no matter what, you've always felt like you deserve to be loved. You might have been angry about it, but along the cheerful optimism and was a lot of stubbornness that I think other people missed. You have a stubbornness about you and a strong sense of who you are. You were angry at Dad because, well, you thought you deserved his love, and didn't you? Yes, Lila said slowly, and you told Everett that you loved him when you were 17 because you thought you deserved the love from him to love you back, J.J. pressed. I guess I did, Lila said, her tone a bit grouchy. And you told him that you loved him this week because you thought you deserved for him to love you back still. Yes, Lila said, and I guess that's true, but I... A lot of times when you have been hurt, like we all have, you don't believe that. I know it's something that I struggled with. Maybe he doesn't believe that he deserves it either. I... She thought about Everett for about everything he told her about his father, a man who had clung to the land even when his wife and son suffered. A man who had sacrificed his own health and let himself die a treatable disease rather than going and getting it checked. Leaving his wife and child alone with that same albatross. And she wondered how in the world he would feel like he deserved anything. Then there was the ex-wife. His ex-wife had never truly loved him. She loved the idea of him, and maybe just maybe. It wasn't that he didn't love her. It was that he didn't believe that she loved him. Because it couldn't believe... He couldn't believe, have believed that anyone would love him. Well, he didn't say any of that to me, Lila said, and I'm tired I'm tired of humiliating myself. Her words echoed inside of her. I just can't hope forever that things will turn out. I can't believe for everyone. And suddenly she found J.J.'s arm around her, followed by Kira's. You don't have to, J.J. said. Kira kissed the top of her head. We believe in you. Leela blinked. Grandma June had said that I was going to have to do some things here that I wouldn't like. I thought she just meant being organized. I thought she meant making lists. I think she meant that I had to understand some things about the world. That sometimes not everything is going to turn out. But also that it doesn't mean it's a waste. She swallowed hard. I want to, everything to connect up and I want it to mean something. And a huge part of my heart wants to believe in destiny and fate. In the one. But no matter what happens with Everett. I have learned things here, and I'm here with you, with both of you. Maybe it's okay that not everything can be fixed and perfect. Kira frowned. I always liked that you thought it could be, she said. I don't know what it says for the rest of us if you can't believe in the best outcome, Leela. Well, sometimes you're not going to get the best outcome, she said. Sometimes you're just going to get your heart stomped on. But then your sister and your cousin show up and hug you, and you're all together in your grandmother's farmhouse, so maybe that has to be enough. And the three of them looked around the room. We're missing Grandma June, Kira said, and Bella. I know, Leela said, but maybe that's just going to be the way it is, too. Great. Grandma June is gone. Bella is God knows where. Maybe we can never have everything wrapped up in a neat little bow in, my lo in life. Maybe I want too much. I've always loved your dreams, Kira said. You can always have a tea party for chickens, Kira, Leila said, but it doesn't mean the chickens will like the tea party or something like that. I like to think they did, J.J. said. It's just that they couldn't pick up the teacups. Lila laughed at the absurdity of it, at the fact her sister was engaging in absurdity about all of that, because it was deeply un-J.J. of her. Thank you, she said. I didn't really want to include the chickens, but maybe we can have some tea. I would like that, Kira said. Me too, J.J. responded. And if you need anything else for that red sled bazaar, you know we can help you. That would be good, Lila said. Yes, I would recommend, or I would really appreciate it if you could be there. Everett might be there, and I might do something we all regret. Like, J.J. said, like beating him to death with one of Grandma June's raffidus scarecrows. I'd help, J.J. said cheerfully. Well, if nothing else, I can appreciate the support. They all set out to make tea and getting out the floral teacups that Layla had always used with the chickens. And for some reason, without talking about it, they got five cups and set out two extra empty spaces at the table. Grandma June and Bella. 
Even in her diminished state, those cups felt a little bit like hope, enduring, believing, love. And no matter what, she wasn't ready to give up on all that entirely. JJ and Kira were here, and there was no way to feel utterly hopeless. Okay, 410, 411, 412, 414. Everett, okay. Everett went out the next morning and rode his horse around the perimeter of the property, taking in everything that he owned, everything that was his, but whatever he expected, whatever he was waiting for, just didn't seem to be there. It hit him like a revelation dropped out of the sky. He was waiting for the same thing that perhaps his father had been waiting on for, for the land to love him back. Because the land was less of a risk than a person. And Everett had tricked himself into thinking that perhaps his land did love him back and so he didn't need anything else. His land gave him back to him and it sustained him. But sitting out here now on the back of a horse, surveying everything that he had decided to make himself a man worthy of calling himself one, he knew that it was hollow. Money was not love. And dirt was just dirt. It was fear that made a man pour everything into that dirt rather than into a flesh and blood around all that he cared for. He saw his father for what he clearly was for the first time. Not a realist, not a fool, but a man who was deeply afraid of what he didn't understand of what he couldn't have dominion over, who held himself at a distance from his wife and child and gave it to the farmland because in the end that was easier, and the thought of his father and the thought of Grandma June. His father died and had gone back to the dirt, and that dirt had been the ultimate love of his life, and that felt like it. It felt like he was gone. Then there was Grandma June had loved people and love whose love had filled up the farmhouse. Her love for those who came in it was far greater than the structure itself and it felt like she remained, woven into the fabric of who he was. Her love had felt soaked into every board of that house, her caring stitched into every quilt there. It was love that made places like that matter, love that gave things meaning, and that love gave a man a real purpose. Lila was right, he was a coward, because on some level he had always imagined that he might not be worthy of love. He never intended to give his whole heart to anyone for the fear he would not get it back. Lila loved anyway, fearless, strong Lila. He thought of her as silly as before, an overly enthusiastic, frothy kind of girl, but he could see the bravery in everything she did and everything she was. In her resolute hold on to hope and made his life worth living, and her willingness to love a man like him and to hold fast to that love even in the face of rejection again. And what had he done to her to earn this love of a woman like that? He didn't think he had earned it. Maybe it was magic that settled uncomfortably over her, his skin, made everything crackle beneath. He didn't want to believe in something that he couldn't hold on to. But right now he needed to, needed to believe in that fantastical and wondrous and invisible, Lila. Like a golden thread that held all together those pieces in his life without which it would fall apart. He loved her. He loved her no matter how terrifying that was, no matter how little he understood it. She put herself out there for him not once but twice. And he owed her nothing less. He was going to give Lila Frost the declaration that she deserved. Okay, page 414. I wish I would have marked where I put to start at 414. Okay, 414, 415, 416, 417, 418, and 419, and we're done. <sighs> More water. Okay. It was a great and grand kicked off to the holiday season with decor fit for Halloween, Thanksgiving and going all the way to Hanukkah and Christmas for Lila though, the success was somewhat muted. Here she was in Everett's barn holding a piece of apple cake in her hand that she couldn't bring herself to even take a bite at, staring at booth number seven, not because the felted animals were cute, but because she and Everett had been together at that booth. 
and she had sanitized it because she was thoughtful that way but that didn't erase the memories someone looped an arm around her shoulder and gave her a light squeeze and she looked up to the left it was JJ who stood a good four inches taller than she did you okay I will be she looked around and saw Laura and Ellie running around the barn Cade keeping watch over them like a paranoid hawk Lila reached into her purse and pulled out two felted mice for Miss Jones that had gifted to her. Here, Lila said, handing these to J.J. What are these? J.J. asked, looking askance at her. I don't want your rodents. They're for Lola and I, Ellie. They should have them. Thank you, J.J. said clearly, still in a deep unwanted them, but unwilling, obviously willing to have them for the girl's sake. Tell them they're from Aunt Lila. And that, I want to see them more, I think. I think I want to move here. I've been thinking, J.J., that I know that none of this went exactly the way I wanted it to, but this did, she said, gesturing around the barn. The arrangements, the flowers, I think we really could have something. I don't want to go back to the florist in Portland and work for someone else. I want to build something with you. I want to be here, where the best part of our childhood was, where I want to be near you and Kira because you are my family, the only real family I have. and. Whatever happens with Everett, that's not going to change. J.J. pulled her in and gave her a hug. I want that too, she said. Really, everything down to the flower shop, as long as you ha deal with the people. I'm happy to deal with the people. Good, because I'm not. I'd rather dig in the dirt. That's fine with me, because, I mean, that's what makes us a good team, that we're different. J.J. grinned. Yeah, I guess that's what makes us a good team. Then she took the mice over to Lola and Ellie who squealed, and Lila had a feeling that J.J. and Cade were going to end up buying quite a few more of Mrs. Jones before the day was up. It took Lila a moment to realize that the music had stopped. Suddenly, all she could hear was the sound of voices rising up over the crowd. Excuse me for a moment. That was when she heard ever. She blinked, beating a hasty retreat out of the barn and to the stage area. Hi, Lila, Everett said. He was standing on a stage, and she could think of nothing that Everett McCall would have liked less than to be standing on a stage. What are you doing? she hissed. I have a little bit of a public humiliation to engage in, though whether or not it ends up in humiliation might be up to you. A whole crowd gathered now, people filtering out from the barn to come out and watch what was about to happen. Lila Frost, Everett said, you have told me that you love me in good faith more than once now. And I was much too of a fool to recognize that I, the thing I needed the most, that I see now. I hope it isn't too late because I love you, Lila, and I want to marry you. I want to have babies with you and all those things I said I didn't want. I want them because it would be with you. Only in books, girls. A ripple went through the crowd, and Lila was the part of that ripple because she couldn't believe it. She knew that there would be people in this town who wouldn't believe what that stayed steady Everett McCall was confessing his love to an airy fairy Lila Frost. Frankly, neither could Lila. This can't be real, she said. It is, he said, still speaking into the microphone. It is, and I'm going to stand up here and keep telling you how much I love you until you get me an answer, until I embarrass us both, which really wasn't the idea, because I'm trying to even the playing field. I love you, she shouted. I love you even though you are a little bit of a well, you were a jerk. She would have been in a stronger word, but there was children present. Will you marry me, he asked. Yes. She scampered up to the stage, flung her arms around his neck, kissed him hard. He dropped the microphone. You were right, he murmured. I was scared, but my love for you is bigger than fear. And that's what I want. More than my ranch or my horses. More than what I consider to be a success. I'm not a success if I don't have you, Lila Frost, and that's the God's honest truth. I love you, she said, kissing him again. She looked around and saw everyone watching them, the whole town witnessing the triumph, and right there in front of her were Kira and JJ. Somehow, she felt like Grandma June was probably watching, too. She had always believed in her heart that she could be loved, that the world was beautiful, even though it was hard sometimes, that if you just hoped and kept on hoping that your day would come, it was even better, though. She learned over these past few weeks it was more than hope, more than optimism. If you were willing to take a chance, if you were willing to change, if you could reach deep down and find a way to heal some of your own hurts, you could free yourself up to a lot more love. I guess sometimes you have to do things you don't like to have the one thing that you need, he said. I guess so. And you know what? You were the one after all. 
She had been right all along. Her heart was too big, too loving, too soft. Hadn't been any of those things after all. It had been true, and it had been for him, and it had just been right all along, and so were you. <sighs> Lila and Everett stayed in the house for the rest of the fall. It was inconvenient for him to move back and forth between his ranch and the farmhouse given the early mornings that he had to put in, but it was worth it to him, and Lila felt like she had to finish out her season. It was wonderful to be able to finish it up with him. Two things happened before she left the farmhouse. The first was that she took a hold of one of the little floral teacups that she once used for the chicken tea parties and that she used it again to bond with her own cousin and sister and wrapped up in fine paper so that it could come with her to her new house, her new life, so that she would never forget who she was. That girl with the tea parties and the fanciful imagination, the one who had always believed in love, rightly so. Sorry. The second thing that happened was Kira called her breathless. Grandma June's lawyer said they finally found an address for Bella and she would be coming. After she got off the phone with Kira, she put the, her hand on the door frame. Something tells me that Bella is going to need one of the, your miracles, she whispered. It would sure be nice of you to give her one. She made sure to leave the house warm, a fire running in the wood stove something bright and welcoming for her cousin none of them had seen for so long but when she left and closed the door behind her a breeze kicked up and unbeknownst to lila the fire went dark on she and everett went to their house own house where they created enough heat between them to warm the impending winter and all the winters thereafter can you tell she brought me to tears almost twice Ms. Yates, one of my favorite authors of all times. The story with Grandma June n not only knows what's best for bringing the two sisters and cousin closer, but the fear, the cowardice, the running from responsibility called love is clearly brought to the forefront. I loved this story. 20 stars, and that makes it a must read. I miss some of the most romantic parts, but if you have a romantic heart, you can read those parts if you want to. It's more for the mature audience, but what a wonderful section. What a wonderful author. Tomorrow we will pick up with winter. I will do those two par portions that I told you about for Dear Bombshell, where I fix your relationship problems, or I try to, and where you've asked me questions, and I'll do my best answer. So, and I'll definitely have to do How Was My Day Bombshell, so you don't want to miss out on that. So I want you to keep your social distance, wash your hands when you can't wash your hands, use your hand sanitizer, and always wear your mask. God bless, until we meet again tomorrow.